Man, it is good to be here with you this morning. It's just a good day to be alive. I, I love uh, today for a couple of reasons. One, I'm wearing my Chick-fil-A tie, and that's my lucky tie, and I love Chick-fil-A. Um, but I'm sad that it's, op- or, or it's closed on Sundays. Um, but Agave Grill uh, is a, a Mexican restaurant that there's a family, Eduardo and his wife, Elena Placencia. They own it. They are normally closed on Sundays, um, but they're going to be taking some time. It's a family-run business, uh, and they're going to be taking some time during the holidays, so they're trying to budget and, and um, make sure that they can have their shop closed. And so they're open today from 11.30 to 2.30. I went to lunch last week um, at Agave, and it was packed, and it was so good. It was so uh, just, oh man, fajitas. I have something called a cubana, some chicken, some, some rice, some beans, some quesadillas, some tacos. You know what I'm saying? Is anybody else getting a little hungry here? All right, yeah. Well, one more thing. Tonight, if you're college age, 18 to 23, uh, I'm hosting a uh, Thanksgiving feast at my house. I've got a 24-pound turkey cooking right now. Uh, My wife's making mashed potatoes, cream corn. So all you have to do is show up, bring a side to share, and uh, bring the party with you. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you need the address to my house, uh, come and find me or or find someone else your age and, and get in contact with me. So that's tonight at 6. Um, I am, I am, before I get started, I'm just so thankful um, for a congregation like you guys. It, it truly is a joy to be your pastor, and, and New Hope, I believe, truly is a, a special place. And uh, I, I don't believe that New Hope is great because the pastors, um, although I do think that we have some pretty good ones, I don't think that New Hope is a special place and a great place because of the preaching, although there are um, a, a good we, we do have a good preaching team, I believe. It's, it's not because of the great music or the orchestra or the choir, although we do have a lot of talent. What makes New Hope so special is you guys. And, and um, if you want New Hope to be warm and inviting and loving, encouraging and tight-knit family, then you carry a responsibility as much as I carry that responsibility. And so I want to commend you guys. I want to thank you guys. I was so impressed Saturday morning. There were like 25 or 30 guys that got up and, and helped move this set and, and start assembling it. And, and uh, I, I'm just so proud to be your guys' pastor on the same breath, I want to encourage you to not just merely attend church, but to become the church, um, because that's what Christ is calling to us. So thank you for making it a joy to be your pastor. We're going to be reading from John chapter 14, and as we wrap up this final sermon in the series, Jesus Is, where we go through the book of John and and Jesus' eight I am statements. And as you turn to John 14, I just want to quickly pray and ask that Jesus would anoint this time, that his word would be quickened to our hearts, and that by his Holy Spirit, we would leave here changed this morning. So Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning with expectation of you to do great things. I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint me, would flow through me, and that you would communicate exactly what you want to communicate. Open up ears, open up eyes, open our hearts. In Jesus' name, and everybody said... Amen, amen. Let's read John 14, starting in verse 1. You can follow along in your Bibles or the screen. Do not let your hearts be troubled. This is Jesus speaking. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. 
believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, Keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The word cannot accept him, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This morning, I've got five points that conveniently all start with the letter P. I kind of feel like Pastor Hawkins, he's always got these nice, neat outlines that all start with C or P or T or whatever, and you're rubbing off on me, and I'm not sure if I like that or not, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm working into it. This is good. The first word is peace. In, in the first verse of this passage, Jesus addresses the disciples' troubled hearts. You see, in chapter 13, Jesus just finishes telling the disciples um, that one of them was going to betray him that Peter was going to disown him three times before the rooster crows, and that he was only going to be with them for a short while longer. Jesus was going away, and so if you can put yourself in their sandals, you can imagine that there was trouble in their hearts. They were likely fearful, and, and you know, they were confused. Where was Jesus going? What were they supposed to do? After all, they left their occupations and have been following Jesus around for the last three years. You could obviously see that, that their hearts are troubled, and Jesus, sensing their troubled and confused hearts, takes a minute to minister to them. In verse 1, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Or, or in um, another version of my NIV Bible, it says, trust, you trust in God, trust also in me. Hear me this morning. If you struggle with a lack of peace in your life, if you struggle with anxiety in your life, if you struggle with just worrying about different things in our life, take heed to Jesus' words. Trust me. You believe and you trust in God. Trust in me. This is worth writing down. Trust in God is the key that unlocks peace to your life. Trusting in God wholeheartedly, completely trusting in him, will unlock peace, a sustaining peace peace in your life. I believe that one of the major markings of a Christian should be peace. When death affects us, we don't mourn as those that have no hope. We can have peace when death comes our way. When money gets tight, we can have the assurance that just as God watches out for the lilies in the field and, and the birds in the air, God is going to take care of our needs. Not our wants, our needs. You know, Sometimes uh, we have uncertainties of our future, but we can have peace knowing that God has a plan and a purpose for our life. But the problem is, is most of us don't fully trust God. We never receive full sustaining peace because it's difficult for us to release control of everything. I'm a little bit of a control freak. Maybe uh, some of you can relate. If we really believe that God is really God, and if we really believe that God is good. And if we really believe that God has our best interest in his mind, did you know that this morning, that God has your best interest in mind? The, the Bible and the rules and the boundaries that God calls us to live in is because he has your best interest in mind. He calls us to purity because he doesn't want hurt in your life. If we really believe that God is God and that he is a good God and that he has our best interest in mind, then why can't we completely trust him? Ask yourself this. Do you do your best to obey his every command? Because if you fully trust God, you will fully trust and, or you will fully obey him. I don't believe that you can have full obedience to God without 
first fully trusting God. You cannot fully obey all of God's commands unless you first fully trust God. When you completely trust God, you will understand and know true peace. It is well will become your life anthem. Jesus has a peace to offer you this morning, but it starts and requires by you letting go and completely trusting in him and his plan. And if you're here this morning and you need peace in your life, at the end of my sermon, I'm gonna open up the altars and invite those that, that just need to, to feel God's peace. And, and maybe you need to say, God, I'm letting go and I'm stepping forward as an act of faith, trusting in you. I'm gonna in, open up the altars and invite you forward to be prayed for at the end of this service. The second word I want to highlight is place is place. Jesus is all about places. You see, he left his place to come to our place, to take our place, so that one day we can go back with him to his place. Right now, Jesus is preparing a place for you in heaven. Verse two, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. Oftentimes, Jesus refers to himself as the groom and the church as the bride. You all, right now, we are the bride of Christ. And in Jesus' time, it was customary for the groom to spend some time away from the bride preparing his family's house. He would go away, go to his family's house, and he would add on a room or an insula. Turn to your neighbor and say, insula. And they would add on to a room, and then he would return and come grab his bride and bring her back to his family's house. Houses back then were much different than they are today. Houses in Jesus' day were were one story, and oftentimes there would be multiple rooms. Uh, If you've ever been to Israel and, and you've been to the city of Capernaum, that's where Peter's house is. There's a giant church that's built over it that kind of is suspended over it. It looks like a spaceship. It's kind of weird. I was kind of like, that's kind of weird. But um, archaeologists believe that in that house, in Peter's house, which I've been, I've seen with my own eyes, this isn't made up, this isn't a fairy tale, there's 15 rooms and upwards of 100 people lived in his house. You see, Jesus is painting this picture of heaven where we're one giant family, all living in close proximities, living together in unity. And I believe that most people love Thanksgiving and Christmas so much because that's a time when they get to see your entire family. There's so many laughs and there's so many great memories when the whole family gets together. But I also believe that most people who really dislike Thanksgiving or Christmas are the people who might not have good relationships with their family or they don't have family to share the holidays with. Jesus is telling his disciples, look, I'm going to heaven to add onto my father's house and make a room for you. He's making a room for you. There, we will be with all of our family. We will eat, we will laugh, we will sing songs, we will celebrate, we will worship for all eternity. What a beautiful picture that Jesus is painting. But this imagery that Jesus is using doesn't just stop there. Jesus doesn't just leave to prepare a place for us. He leaves us with a promise of his return. Verse three says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. That doesn't sound very wishy-washy. That doesn't sound like a probability, like rolling the dice. Jesus will come back and take you to be with me. Or the King James Version says, I will come back and take you unto myself, that you also may be where I am. Jesus is using this idiom, take you unto myself to get his point across. You see, in the same way that a groom would leave and prepare uh, uh, his bride to go prepare a room on his family house, so is Jesus going and preparing a room. And in the same way that the groom would eventually, after a period of time, return to get his and collect his bride that was eagerly awaiting him, so too Jesus is gone to heaven and he's preparing a place for you, and we as his church, as a bride, should be eagerly waiting for his return. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story about 10 virgins waiting for the return of their groom. When the groom finally returned, five of them were ready, and five of them were not. Are you ready this morning? 
although our generation gives lip service to the idea of heaven, and although our, our generation gives lip service to the idea that Jesus is going to come back, we don't live out those realities very well. A society that doesn't believe in heaven will be obsessed with youthfulness. It will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to look and stay and feel young. A society that doesn't believe in Jesus' promise of eternal life will spend billions of dollars on life support systems to delay facing an unknown future. In a society that doesn't believe in heaven or hell, crime will soar without fear of eternal judgment. The theology of a society that doesn't believe that Jesus could come back at any moment would be based upon the here and now, upon health and prosperity. Ask yourself, do you live for heaven? Do you really live for heaven? Do you have this uh, understanding that we are pilgrims passing through? You know, we live in America, and we are very fortunate to live in America. I'm thankful that I do. It's not a perfect country, but I don't know that there is one, except for the kingdom of God, right? But with the... um, money that comes with America and and just having the opportunity, that creates a lot of distractions in our life. I've, I've, you know, seriously contemplated, like, man, maybe I should sell my house and just buy, like, a trailer and live in a trailer, like, and, um, like, uh, uh, like pull behind my truck where I've got my vehicle and I've got my camping trailer, I've got my necessities, then I wouldn't have to worry about my lawn, I wouldn't have to worry about this, I wouldn't have to worry about that. You see, we get so consumed with living for the things of this earth that we forget that we're citizens of heaven. Do you live for heaven? Do you live knowing that today could be your last? I don't say that to create fear, but I say that to keep things in perspective. Jesus has promised his return. I have friends that don't know Jesus. I have friends that I grew up to, together with that, that I care so deeply about. And I could lie to myself and say, you know what, I'll, I'll speak to them about Jesus. I'll pray for them in a month. I, 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 will, I will go out of my way, I'll do things, you know, But what if I fall out of a tree stand and die? What if Jesus comes back? What if I don't have tomorrow? I do my best, but it is hard because of all the distractions in this life. I do my best to live with an eternal lens, with an eternal perspective. An eternal perspective will do three things for you. The first thing that will do for you is will purify. Everybody say purify since I can't say it. Purify living a life thinking about heaven, you will sin less. First John 3, 3 says, all who have this hope, meaning the hope of being with Jesus someday, he purifies himself just as Jesus is pure. The second thing that living life with an eternal lens does is it motivates you to fulfill God's commission, which is to go unto all the world, preaching, teaching, baptizing, making disciples. There's this sense of urgency of bringing people to Jesus. Parents, hear me out. Your great commission and your main priority right now as you have children under your influence is your children. Too often we we leave the teaching and the evangelizing and the leading to the church. Man, every day, every day it is our responsibility as parents to lead and and to take that commission of Jesus to make disciples. Um, That was a screw. That was messing me up. Um, to make disciples of our children. It's not the church's responsibility. We're supplement. We're like that extra thing that comes alongside you guys as you do that. And I believe that you can do that. And if you're feeling guilt right now because you haven't done a great job, don't. Let it push you. Allow the Holy Spirit to, to, to come inside you and help you uh, do a better job. So living life with an eternal lens, it purifies us, it motivates us, and brings an urgency to the Great Commission, and it also gives us peace. Trusting in Jesus that he's coming back, trusting that he's preparing a place for us, focusing on our our eternal home brings a peace in our life. Someone once said this, for the unbeliever, life on earth is as good as it gets. But for the believer, life on earth is as worse as it gets. Man, if we can remember that when storms blow our way, we can have peace. 
we can have peace because life on earth right now in this moment, that's as bad as it gets for us believers because we're citizens of heaven. We're just pilgrims passing through. If you're here this morning and you feel like you haven't been living with an eternal lens, today is the day to start. And at the end, I'm going to open up the altars and I encourage you to respond. Jesus offers us peace. Jesus is preparing a place for us. Jesus has left us, but he has left us with a great promise of his return. And in verse 6, Jesus reveals his plan for salvation. Verse 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If there were one verse in all of the Bible that might be the most controversial verse in society's eyes, this would be the verse. Because what Jesus is saying that I am the way. I am the way, not a way. I am the way. Jesus is saying that all other religions are wrong. All other methods of going to heaven are wrong. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Proverbs 16, 25 says, there is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. There's a popular belief that all gods are the same and and all roads lead to heaven, not according to the scripture, not according to Jesus. Acts 4, 12 says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's through Jesus. This is hands down the most important theological understanding of the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, very famous passage. I'm sure many of you know it. If you don't, you need to memorize this. For it is by grace through faith that a man is saved, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. This verse should bring so much relief in our hearts. That should bring so much relief that Jesus is the way to heaven. There are two major themes in Christianity, and both are very dangerous. The first is cheap grace. This is a grace that has no power in it. This, this message of cheap grace is we all sin and we'll continue to sin, so it's okay. There's no need to invite the Holy Spirit into your life so that you can be victors. There's no need for the Holy Spirit to come in your life so that you can overcome. But Pastor Hawkins' close acquaintance, the Apostle Paul, says, shall we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? Paul says, shall we keep on sinning so, so God can can." you know, extend his grace further? By no means. He says, don't trample on the blood of Jesus. Cheap grace is not real grace. But on the other dangerous message that's being preached that many of you might relate to is feeling that at any moment you could have your salvation ripped away from you because you sin or you do something against God. I remember, and maybe some of you can relate to this, but I remember in middle school, every altar call I felt like I had to respond because I felt like as I was at school, I was losing my salvation and then I'd come to Wednesday night church and it'd like wake me up. And, and you know, that's eternal insecurity. The Spirit of God comes in so you can have witness in your heart so that you can know that and know and know that you are saved. Hear me this morning. There is nothing that you can do that will get your way to heaven. I suspect that the reason Jesus made it so clear that he was the way and the only way is because he was speaking to a whole bunch of Jews that were so consumed with the law that they completely missed out on knowing the Father, upon knowing Jesus. It is purely through faith in Jesus Christ by his grace. Grace is a gift. Grace is giving us something that we don't deserve. Faith literally means pistis in the Greek. Faith, trusting so much in God that I will obey you with no reservation. That's why James describes his faith as deeds. James wasn't doing good things to earn salvation. James was doing good things from his salvation. James believed in Jesus' words and James trusted Jesus' words and out of that belief and trust flowed his obedience. Jake Womax is a, a good friend of mine and, and I see you guys up here and, and I just want to extend my, my sympathies to your family as you've lost your grandfather this week. Um, I've been praying for you and Nate and, and everyone affected. Um, uh, but, but Jake is a good friend of mine and Wednesday night he was sharing with our college age students that for a long time when he sinned, he would put himself in this penalty box with God. And it's like, oh, I gotta serve my time before I can 
I can talk to God again, you know, and after he's in there and he's kind of beat himself up for two or three days, him and God were cool because he served his time. Is that you this morning? Do you need to take yourself out of the penalty box? God's mercy and his grace is something so much greater than you and I can ever comprehend. And if you're here this morning and you've been feeling the pressures of earning love from Christ, it's time for you to trust the plan. It's time for you to acknowledge that it's through Jesus. In the same way, um, I won't go there, never mind. Jesus, I know, Jesus is the only way. It's nothing that we can earn, it's nothing that we can deserve, and it's all because of Jesus, and it's all through Jesus that we can be overcomers of our sin. Peace, place, promise, plan, and finally purpose. As the musicians come, I want to talk to you about God's purpose for your life. Once you trust God's plan of salvation and and make peace with him, and, and once you believe that Jesus is preparing your place in heaven and you believe the promise of his return, then God will start to use you to fulfill your purpose in life. Take a look at verses 12 and 13. Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name. Why? So that new hope can be glorified? So that people can see your spiritual badge? So that you can be known as someone that gifts flow through and you've got healing? No. It's to give glory to the Father in heaven. The word believes in, in, in this passage in the Greek is pisteon. This word is a form of pistis, which is faith. And so this verse wouldn't make sense in English to say, very truly I tell you, whoever faiths in me. So believes in this passage, whoever believes in me will do these works. Believes in this passage means trusting that leads to obedience. And you can be sure that as God leads you and he calls you to do things and you obey that, he will equip you by his spirit. It's not by might, it's not by uh, strength, it's not by power, but it's by God's Holy Spirit. But what about these greater things? Does that mean since Jesus healed 10 lepers that, that we will heal 11? I believe that these greater things that Jesus is talking about is seeing spiritual wholeness and healings take place. Jesus performed many miracles so that people would know that he also had the authority to forgive sins. When we, will we still uh, see miracles today? Absolutely. Should we still pray for miracles today? Absolutely. But I believe that someone coming to Christ is far greater than someone being healed of cancer. You know, many, I, I look out and I see faces like Bill and, and, and there's just so many other that have been affected um, by cancer. And it, it becomes so easy just to pray and, and, and just to pray for that person because the life and death, you know, and, and it's just a scary word. It's a scary thing. But do we have that same urgency of praying for the people that are lost, that we know and that we love, that are going to eternal separation from God? Jesus' last words on earth were to go and make disciples. Our purpose in life is to bring people to know Jesus. Did you hear that? Your purpose in life is to bring and point other people to Jesus. I don't want you to take the responsibility for their salvation, but you do have a responsibility to that person, to encourage them, to pray them, to drag them by the ear if you have to, and get them to church so that they can hear the good news, so that they can experience the presence of God. Would you all stand? As you stand, just bow your heads, close your eyes. You know, why do we close our eyes? Why do we bow our heads? You know, it's kind of a Christian-y thing to do, but the reason why is so that we can tune out all distractions around us. When we're not looking at the person in, in front of us, when we're not worried about anybody else, we can just have this moment where God is speaking to us. And I believe firmly that God's Holy Spirit is speaking to everyone here, and he wants to minister to you in this moment. This morning, Jesus is extending peace to the troubled hearts in this room. 
Jesus is calling us to live with an eternal perspective. Jesus is asking you to trust his plan of salvation. Jesus is giving new purpose for your life. And in just a moment, I'm gonna open the altars for prayer and invite anyone that wants prayer, whatever the need is, to come forward. There's nothing weird about that. There's nothing embarrassing about that. That's biblical. Jesus tells us to pray for one another, to encourage one another. But before I open the altars, I wanna give the opportunity for anyone here that hasn't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior to do so. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins, to enter your heart, to save your soul, and you want to do that, would you just raise your hand this morning so that I can pray for you? Every eye closed. Is there anyone here that would say, Pastor Austin? Yes. Is there any others? Thank you, Jesus. God, I I pray right now that your grace and your mercy would overwhelm our hearts. God, I, I pray that as we repent of our sins, that we wouldn't just run from sin, that we wouldn't just try to avoid sin, but that we would run to your arms that are sustaining, that are life giving, God. And I pray this morning that your power of your Holy Spirit would enter your people's hearts, that you would allow them to experience that peace of knowing that things are squared with you because of Jesus Christ. I pray that your spirit would enter our hearts so that we can be overcomers, that chains of addiction and bondage would be broken in Jesus' name. I pray that healing would be taken place this morning in Jesus' name, all for your glory, God. Jesus' name we pray.